When it comes to preventing heart disease and stroke, most doctors are really focused on lowering your LDL cholesterol. But in today's video, we're gonna make the case that actually lowering your triglycerides and monitoring your blood triglyceride levels are actually a better indicator of your overall cardiometabolic disease risk. You might say, well, why is that, Mike? What about triglycerides? My doctor hasn't actually mentioned my triglycerides. I don't even know what my blood triglyceride level is or, or are, uh, so what do I do? So let's talk a little bit more about that. Now, let me just pause here because just last week, there was a recent analysis of over, it was a meta-analysis including over 20 studies involving over 140,000 individuals. This was published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, finding that statin treatment by cholesterol, LDL cholesterol reduction has a minimal marginal and inconsistent benefit with overall reduction in all cause and cardiovascular disease, mortality and incidence of stroke, okay? So again, after years, since 1994, when this 4S study came out, there was various studies to show that lipid lowering by way of statins uh, is going to really completely change the prevalence of heart disease related deaths and so forth in the US and throughout the world. Now, what have we seen since then? Well, according to data from last year, our own CDC found that amid a respiratory virus pandemic, heart disease was still the leading cause of mortality. Heart disease was also the leading risk factor behind age and obesity with regards to severe COVID. So what's the marker that you can measure at your next physical or just going to a lab and checking to see if you're at risk for cardiometabolic disease. My friends, it's not LDL cholesterol. It's not, I'm sorry, because LDL cholesterol changes. Uh, one of the best ways to really be more specific about measuring the atherogenicity associated with LDL cholesterol is ApoB. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but I think it's actually better just to focus today on triglycerides because triglycerides uh, and the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, the remnant lipoproteins, RLP, so remnant lipoproteins, uh, these are little spherical triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. They tend to be more atherogenic and linked with insulin resistance. So this is, I think, the most important thing. And let me just, before we get into why insulin resistance is linked with heart disease and how looking at triglycerides, looking at your ApoB, looking at your remnant lipoproteins and VLDL is a better way to get an overall assessment of your cardiometabolic risk compared to just looking at LDL cholesterol. I just wanna welcome you back before we dive into it. It's Mike Mutzel, as always, friends. Thank you for being here. We are going to dive in to metabolic health. I'm glad that you're enjoying this video. If you are, hit that like button. Be sure to leave a comment below and directly share this with a friend who you know is focused on LDL cholesterol because I can tell you dinner conversations with friends or family, they'll be like, oh yeah, my LDL is good. It's 110, you know, and some will say, oh, mine's better. It's 90, right? Well, then you say, well, what are your triglycerides? They're going to say, my what? They don't really know, right? So we want to share and spread the message that triglyceride reduction and monitoring is actually a little bit better. Okay. So thank you for helping us spread that message. Okay. So you have a meal. Oh, I'm going to draw it over here. I'm getting tight on space. So you have your mixed meal, okay? That is going to go through your chylomicrons to your liver. You can see how bad I am at, at drawing your, this is your liver, okay? And then you're gonna have these, these chylomicrons and these uh, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins starting to be secreted after a meal, okay? Uh, and so these are little chylomicrons and, and triglyceride-enriched remnants and VLDL and IDLs and so forth, and those are gonna go out into your periphery. These are actually much more atherogenic compared to just your straight up LDL. And this is missing that when you're getting your blood work. And so what I suggest, if you know your LDL and you're on a statin or you were told to be on a statin, check your ApoB because that's going to look at all of the atherogenic lipoprotein particles, the IDLs, the VLDLs, the remnants, the LDLs, and all the different subtypes. And so look at your ApoB to A1 ratio, my friends this will cost you about $13, maybe less. I mean, that's the price that I pay for this when I would order it for clients through LabCorp. It's 12 to $13. Um, so money is not an issue here, right? But the triglycerides is also going to give you an indicator here because the reason why LDL is not all that good is if you look at, in terms of a measurement of atherogenic risk, if you look at a low density lipoprotein particle, um, you have triglyceride in here, TG, you also have cholesterol esters, okay? Now, when you're insulin resistant, 
there is significantly more triglyceride molecules compared to the cholesterol esters. So your LDL levels could actually be lower than would be indicated compared to your insulin resistance state uh, in your insulin sensitive state and your, your overall metabolic health. And so this is what a lot of doctors don't realize is the Friedwald equation is not accounting for triglyceride rich lipoproteins. And so as you become more metabolically unhealthy, these lipoprotein particles that are circulating are actually triglyceride enriched. And so what you can actually see is people lose weight sometimes and they become more metabolically healthy. Oftentimes their cholesterol levels increase. That's not necessarily a bad thing because the quantity of cholesterol esters as a proportion or as a function of overall composition of uh, material that's floating around in the par lipoprotein particles increases because they're becoming more insulin sensitive and the triglyceride component is decreasing. Does that make sense? If we think about these lipoprotein particles like cars on the road, uh, essentially we're just moving uh, in, we're changing seats, we're having a, a musical chairs in terms of what's contained in the cargo and the triglyceride number actually decreases and that is more of a reflection of an improvement in your metabolic health, not a regression. And this is why my friends, various studies are actually looking at, hey, we ought to rethink the LDL cholesterol hypothesis as it's related to heart disease and reconsider and reprioritize triglycerides because it turns out that the, the, the postprandial increase uh, in the atherogenesis and the, and the phenomenon of, associated with heart disease is linked more to the remnant lipoproteins and the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins that are causing atherogenesis. So we should be focusing on triglycerides, okay? So here's kind of a messy overview. Let's talk about some basic numbers. You might say, okay, Mike, so I'm convinced I should be focusing on my triglyceride numbers. What's an ideal number? Well, Generally, what I suggest for most clients is I want to see it around 60 to 70, okay? Some people come in and their blood triglycerides, and, and by the way, it depends on when your last meal was and the composition of your last meal. So you need to understand if you do a non-fasted uh, blood lab level, you, know, you, you test your labs and compare that to fasted, they're going to be totally different, okay? Triglycerides fluctuate just like your glucose does. So in the fasted state, there's going to be changes compared to them in the post-meal state. So I suggest getting a baseline, get your blood work done, check your fasted triglycerides, see where those are at after a 12 to 14 hour fast. Now let's say they're at 110, they're at 120, or let's say they look really good, they're at 60. You're like, wow, I am so metabolically healthy, I'm good. I don't need to worry about any of this stuff. Okay, next time you do your labs, let's have you have a mixed meal with about 60 to 70 grams of fat. For you, whether you're vegan or vegetarian or you're a carnivore or you're keto, eat a standard meal that you would habitually normally eat. For me, that would be ground beef and eggs, maybe with some avocado, something like that, right? Now, what would I, and this is called a lipid load test because you actually wanna see not just what your fasting triglycerides are, but your post-meal triglycerides. This is called the lipid load test, LLT, okay? A lot of people are talking about this. There was a consensus paper way back going to 2010. I can share it on the screen here where cardiologists and experts and you know, uh, cardiovascular disease were saying, gosh, why are we telling all of our patients to fast before doing labs when we know that the process of atherosclerosis starts after the meal? People don't get heart disease when they're fasting. They get heart disease after they eat Big Macs and cupcakes and donuts, right? So we should be seeing what those cupcakes and ding-dongs are doing to people's triglycerides. And guess what they do? They jack them up through the roof. And so the degree of your insulin resistance is actually reflected in your post-meal triglyceride level. I know a lot of people are focused on, you know, uh, just standard glucose levels and ketones and insulin. All of that stuff is, is helpful to look at. But when your liver starts to get unhealthy and infiltrated with fat, you will see a dramatic increase in the uh, post-meal triglyceride levels. So you might say, okay, Mike, I'm convinced I should now be looking at post-meal triglyceride levels after I know my baseline. What's the number, okay? If your post-meal triglyceride levels go up over 220 milligrams per DL, that is a problem, my friends, because that means that you have an inability to process fat in the post-meal window, most likely because you have some fat infiltration in your liver and you have some degree of insulin resistance, okay? So... To recap, 
We know that LDL cholesterol doesn't tell us the whole story because the low density lipoprotein particles also carry triglycerides. They can become enriched in triglycerides. And so a low LDL cholesterol does not tell you about your cardio metabolic risk because we know that cardiovascular disease cannot be disentangled from metabolic disease. Insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia is baked into the process of atherosclerosis and the narrowing of your arteries. That's big point number one. Big point number two, you need to know your fasting triglyceride levels. Once you know that, on your next labs, it could be a year later, 12 months later, six months later if you're really being proactive, you can then have a mixed meal that has between 60 and 80 grams of fat and see what your post meal, your non-fasting triglyceride levels are at. If they're north of 200, you need to make some improvements, which is where we're gonna focus on right now. What are those improvements? Well, there's a million and one ways to improve your metabolic health. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge, my bias is exercise because the more insulin sensitive your muscles are, the more glucose you can dispose of in your muscles, the more buffer room you have. If you go off the bandwagon and have some standard American food, you go to a birthday party, a Halloween party, whatever, you are gonna have a little bit more ability to deposit some of that post meal energy into your muscle tissue. Uh, insulin sensitive muscle is basically a sponge, a repository for both fats and also glucose. We know that as well. Um, so I'm a huge fan of that, and it's one of the best ways to lower your triglycerides, I should say. Exercise, which is synonymous with healthy muscle, is one of the best ways to lower your triglycerides and your glucose and your insulin. So that's number one, eating a low-carb diet. And there's a million and one ways to go about it. You can be as extreme as a zero-carb carnivore or low-carb vegan if you want. There's a million and one ways to, to, to do this. I suggest experimenting and trying on a diet that works for you. Uh, we know that sleep and circadian rhythm and, and light hygiene, very important to this whole process of cardio metabolic disease. So making sure that you're going to bed at the same time, you're waking up at the same time. We know that cold exposure, thermal stress, actually is a big, uh, big factor. There was just a study that came out uh, late February of 2022 finding that the ability of brown fat to mobilize fatty acids and to be active is linked with metabolic health. And so there's some really good research to support that. We can go down the, the road of dietary supplements. I'm a huge fan of inositol, specifically myo-inositol, berberine as well. I'll put links below to some different ideas and solutions there. And certainly fasting can be very helpful as well as a way to mobilize some of the stored energy, the triglyceride buildup in your adipose tissue, your fat tissue, to utilize that as fuel when you are in a fasted state. So those are the things. Lower your carbs, exercise more, make sure you're balancing your stress and circadian rhythms, uh, getting cold on purpose, and then periodic feeding window compression and fasting is a phenomenal way to, again, improve cardio metabolic health and reduce um, this post-meal atherosclerosis that is so common, uh, leading to uh, premature death from heart disease and stroke. Okay? So hopefully you found this video helpful. As always, let me know in the comments. I will link some of the research here. And just remember to tell people, hey, your triglycerides matter a little bit more than just LDL cholesterol. And if they're convinced that LDL cholesterol is a thing, at least have them test their ApoB to A1 ratio. And I will put links to our blood work cheat sheet that's on our website, highintensityhealth.com. As always, appreciate you tuning all the way in. Thanks for hitting that like button. We'll catch you on a future video down the road. Bye now.